Welcome, everybody. I'm pleased uh, to moderate this uh, new BRZ webinar, which will be on mic encapsulation and pickering, with, in fact, two outstanding uh, specialists of the domain. I just remember you that uh, you have to ask your question only through the Q&A window and use the chat only if you have technical problems. You will, in fact, uh, be able to uh, get back this uh, webinar, this uh, podcast, by going back to the bioencapsulation.net. Uh, I just remember you but, uh, that uh, this webinar is organized by the Bioencapsulation Research Group Association, and you will find all the information on bioencapsulation.net in collaboration with one uh, European project, NCAP for Health. And again, if you want to get more information about NCAP for Health, you can go on uh, his website. The first, in fact, uh, speaker of today will be Claire Berton Carabin, which is in the same time uh, at uh, the French National Institute for Agriculture, Food and Environment uh, in Nantes and in the same time, visiting associate professor in Wageningen University. She is a member of the executive board for the French Society of Lipid Research, you know, and she mainly focuses research on understanding the structure of the food, emulsion, functionality, and as you will see, especially, she has a real interest, in fact, in uh, the Pickering uh, application. Then I'll let you, Claire, take the control of the webinar and make your presentation. Yes, thank you very much, Denis, for this introduction. Can you see my screen and hear me OK? Yes, yes. but you can put full screen. Yeah, so I guess it should work now, right? Uh, okay, well then, um, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank the uh, Bioencapsulation Research Group and especially uh, Denis Ponsley for uh, inviting me to give this presentation today. And thank you also, Denis, for the uh, kind introduction. So um, I, I guess you got from the introduction that uh, Denis gave that I'm actually, I've been actually working quite a lot on uh, emotions and this is actually indeed, uh, pickling emotions is indeed a topic that I've had a lot of interest for, uh, especially in the past few years. And when I got invited to give a presentation at, uh, about in, in a group that is entitled bio-encapsulation, the first question that I asked myself, I, I don't consider myself a specialist of encapsulation uh, actually, uh, well, it was actually, well, uh, what about encapsulation? What is it really? And, and, and what, uh, what is the relation between uh, emotions and, and encapsulation? So as a short introduction to this, this presentation, I would just like to give a, a couple of words about this. And I found actually this interesting uh, forward to, uh, to a recent book uh, where the, uh, the editor of the book mentions that, uh, it, well, it's actually, uh, she, she uses the term uh, mirage encapsulation. So to also warn people that, of course, this has a specific, uh, a specific meaning and a misinterpretation or, or misuse of the, of the term can actually uh, well, cause some, so, some issues. Eh? So, so she, was, she mentions uh, to cast some doubts on the benefits of true uh, encapsulation. So, well, this is a, the, this is of course a, an, an interesting um, uh, an interesting remark and uh, well I would also like to point out that I'm going to talk indeed about uh, emotions pickering emotions but then I, I I think it's really an open question to which extent those systems can can actually be uh, uh, considered encapsulation systems so if uh, I, I looked up a little bit also about definitions of uh, encapsulation system bio encapsulation systems. And it seems that there are actually a, a, a number of features that uh, to, uh, to meet those definitions and to some extent emotions do, uh, but I think there are also uh, so, some points that, uh, that are not really met and, and that you cannot systematically talk about encapsulation when you deal with emotions. And for instance, um, it's mentioned that uh, encapsulation systems are, uh, well, and controlled release systems, they should protect the actives that are in there. 
um, enhance their functionality, which is very broad, of course, and bioavailability. And there is also this, um, th this uh, important concept of having a capsules uh, and, and a wall really around the uh, encapsulation system. And I think in the case of emulsion, of course, you have this thin interface that uh, actually separates the oil and, and the water. Um, but well, whether this is going to really, really be can, whether this can really be considered a, um, a, a, a physical barrier, I think it's really uh, it's really debatable, at least for conventional emotions. Um, now about pickering emotions, I think this is really an open question. Uh, so well, I'm going to, uh, to 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 give this presentation, and I think after that, this uh, this can really be something to think about whether such systems do qualify as uh, as uncaps uh, encapsulation systems. So that being said, uh, generally, I like to recall the fact uh, that, uh, well, I'm, I'm going to talk mostly about food emotions and food applications uh, today. So it's important to recall that a lot of food products that we consume on a daily basis are actually uh, emulsions. So it means a, a dispersion uh, of a liquid in another liquid and both phases are not miscible. Uh, I'm going to talk only about oil in water emulsions today. So this is actually systems where we have oil droplets dispersed in an aqueous continuous phase um, with a lot of uh, possible variation in the size uh, of the oil droplets. And between these two areas, we have the interface, which is a, a thin layer that has to be physically stabilized with emulsifiers. And at least in food systems, there are different categories of emulsifiers that can be used. Uh, so we have uh, the classical ones, which are either low molecular weight emulsifiers. We also have a lot of systems uh, where emulsifiers are uh, amphiphilic biopolymers. And in foods, this is actually mostly uh, represented by proteins. And uh, this is going to be the topic of today. We can also have uh, solid or semi-solid particles that also absorb at the oil water interface and allow for physical stabilization of emulsions. And this is what is uh, normally referred to as picking emulsions. And that's going to be the focus of my uh, talk today. When I talk about emulsions, I always also like to recall that actually uh, generally in most formulations, um, uh, uh, a substantial fraction of the emulsifier uh, that is used uh, also ends up uh, in excess in the continuous phase. And that's true for any uh, of the emulsifiers that I mentioned previously. And this is important to know because it can also have a number of consequences on the physical and chemical stability uh, of the emulsions. So now diving a bit more into the topic of uh, pickering emulsions. Um, this is a type of system that uh, has actually been known for a very long time. The name comes from uh, the name of the researcher who was one of the first to describe them at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, so this is indeed a, a, a specific uh, type of system. As I mentioned, the principle is that uh, the, the fluid interface, in that case, the oil water interface is stabilized by solid particles, so that behave uh, quite fundamentally differently compared to the conventional emulsifiers that I mentioned uh, before. And uh, those particles typically are uh, larger than, than uh, the, the size of molecular uh, emulsifier. And uh, once the particle is absorbed at the oil water interface, it's characterized by a high uh, desorption energy. This is, uh, I believe, the only formula that I'm going to use in the presentation, but it's quite an important one because it uh, gives actually the expression of the uh, of the desorption energy for a particle once it's absorbed at the uh, oil water interface, and you can see that actually it uh, scales with the square of the size of the particle. So the larger the particle, the higher the uh, desorption energy. It's also highly dependent on the contact angle, which is actually characterized by how the particle positions at the interface, which directly depends on uh, the wettability of the particle by both phases, so the oil uh, and, and the water. And also, uh, it depends on the uh, interfacial tension between the oil and the water. Um, so this, um, this option energy that often is very large when the particle actually meets those requirements, so partial wettability by both phases and a, and a, a large enough uh, size. This uh, gives confers the uh, pickering emotions 
some specific features and particular in particular a very high resistance to uh, physical destabilization phenomena such as coalescence and this is uh, very nicely illustrated here uh, on this picture where you see actually two droplets covered by particles that are pressed against each other and uh, because of this very strong absorption of the particles the droplets actually tend not to coalesce or if they do, when the surface coverage by the particles is not uh, high enough, then uh, the particles, they remain actually non-spherical because to recover a spherical shape, which would correspond to a decrease in the surface area, then you would need to desorb some of the particles. This is not possible. So you have this phenomenon of arrested coalescence that is very typical of, uh, of such systems. And more uh, for more food-related uh, applications, uh, there has been this uh, article that was published uh, relatively recently, where the authors actually uh, made pickering illusion with starch granule as the as the particle of choice, and uh, they actually uh, could uh, find stable oil droplets stabilized by those starch granules after an eight-year uh, storage uh, period of time. So this is uh, indeed uh, systems that are highly physically stable. Um, some other important aspects, general aspects about uh, those emotions, it's the fact that also um, the fact that those particles absorb at the interface um, actually uh, induces a local deformation of the, of the interface, which is responsible for lateral attractive interactions uh, between the particles, and that confers the interface with a high uh, mechanical rigidity and strength. So this is also uh, some authors have actually compared uh, the uh, uh, such a layer formed by particles bound together by those uh, attractive capillary interactions as an eggshell. So this is indeed uh, something that is also particular to this uh, type of system. And maybe also one aspect that uh, should be kept in mind is that um, sometimes uh, it's also the, the, the physical stability of picking emotions is also uh, reinforced when the particles can form a network in the continuous phase. So that means that we have some particles that are in present in excess in the in the continuous phase. And um, then, of course, with the point of attention that the fact that you have a particle network in the continuous phase as such is not a criteria. It's a criterion to say that you have a pickering emotion. So because this is really the, the absorption of the particles at the interface. But in practice, this is often observed and this does participate to the to the physical stability of the system overall. So now um, this was very general eh, about picking emotions in, in, in any uh, domain. Something quite interesting when it comes to trends in the food sector, uh, it's the fact that there has been a, a tremendous amount of publications uh, about food picking emotions in the past five to 10 years or so. Um, this actually is a, a phenomenon that is so uh, tremendous that it has been referred to by some uh, authors highly recognized in the field, such as uh, Eric Dickinson from Leeds. Uh, he actually mentioned that uh, we now have entered the neo-pickering era uh, of colloid science in, in, uh, for, for food applications. And this is very true, actually, if you check the, the number of publications in the field, well, of course, uh, uh, it's important to, to, to compare it with the, the, the overall number of publications in the, in the field of food emotions, because it has uh, in itself increased quite substantially. But you can see that this increase is much more sharp and, and, and only indeed in the past um, five to 10 years or so when it comes to pickering emotions. And something interesting is that you can see that in, in 2020, for instance, if you compare the, the, the two uh, uh, y-axis, about uh, one paper out of five published about uh, food emotions was about food pickering emotions. So this is really a, a, a highly growing trend. Um, a drawback of this, of course, is that because it's becoming extremely trendy, um, there is a, well, it's, it's maybe not so clear if all the, the, the work that is done with so-called pickering emotions actually correspond to the strict definition of uh, those systems. And this has also been pointed out by some uh, authors in the field um, where uh, it, it has been uh, mentioned uh, that, um, that, that any type of emotion made with particles is now referred to as a pickering emotion. But of course, does it, uh, does it really correspond to this definition of uh, a solid particle layer uh, around the oil droplets? 
this is really a, this is a, this is a good question, and this should this should certainly be considered with caution. Uh, Brent Murray, also from the University of Leeds, even talks about uh, the Pickering police, which of course is not uh, does not exist uh, yet, but this is really um, meaningful for 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 the for the needs for uh, for for um, well a, a check of the terminology that should be used and proper uh, characterization of the systems to know whether or not they do uh, uh, they do correspond to the to the definition of Pickering emotions. Um, so that being said, uh, when it comes to food applications, which particles can actually be used? Well, the, it's, uh, it's possible to, to define different categories based on the type of ingredients that, uh, that is used to make the particles. So this is what I've done here, and, and you can see some different uh, examples for each category. On principle, it's possible uh, to use uh, certain inorganic particles such as silica or uh, calcium carbonate particles um, to make pickering emulsions and to use for food applications. And uh, some of them are actually uh, uh, are uh, actually um, uh, recognized as uh, as food additives. Um, but in practice, this is uh, especially with the current uh, trend towards uh, natural formulations, clean label. This is really, really not something that's um, uh, that is actually that seem very promising for applications, and and and, and I don't think manufacturers do consider this option uh, at at the moment because actually there is much more uh, effort that is dedicated to. Uh, find uh, particles that are bio-based, so they can be made uh, mostly of proteins, of, of lipids, of polysaccharides, that's for the starch granules, for example, or from other, uh, other bio biomolecules as well. And there are a number of examples that, uh, that have been actually um, developed with uh, particles belonging to those uh, different categories. So this is one way of, uh, of seeing things. Um, oh yeah, maybe also to mention that, um, especially in the case of protein particles, I think it's really interesting to mention that uh, there is also currently um, a lot of attention that is paid to the use of plant proteins instead of animal-based proteins for food formulations and in particular for uh, to, to, to stabilize food emulsions. And I think this is also somewhere maybe where we can have um, both domains that meet, so the, the domain of, of bio-based speaking emulsions and of, of plant proteins, um, because a lot of plant protein ingredients that are available uh, currently on the market actually are not soluble at all. They contain a lot of particles, and therefore it could also be a source uh, for bio-based particles. Uh, and most probably many of those plant protein ingredients work more as, uh, as a particle stabilizers than as a uh, let's say, uh, soluble uh, molecular protein uh, emulsifiers. So that's, uh, that's also something interesting. And this has been also, uh, there has also been some, uh, a nice review published about, uh, about this uh, relatively recently. Um, there is also another way to consider, uh, to categorize the different types of particles that can be used for <clears throat> food applications. And that's, to, um, to define them depending on, on how they have been uh, made. Uh, so focusing only on bio-based particles, it's actually, of course, possible to design some particles purposely. So from separate ingredients that are combined through a highly uh, controlled process and uh, so, that, so that we obtain the particles with the composition and the, and the properties that we want. And then, of course, it's also possible to use some particles that naturally exist in um, different uh, types of uh, bio-based matrices. And then you can distinguish two subcategories, those that can be used as such without modifications, or those that actually are actually natural structures, but that do need a certain degree of modification before they can perform as uh, pickering stabilizers. And a good example of this is uh, starch particles that need to be hydrophobized chemically by chemical grafting before they have a sufficient hydrophobicity to bind to, to the oil water interface. So I'm just here going to give uh, an example of some work that uh, has been done in my laboratory actually when, when I was uh, working at, uh, at Wageningen University. Uh, where we actually developed systems where we actually made uh, lipid, uh, solid lipid particles, so by uh, uh, high temperature homogenization of uh, high melting point fats, followed by cooling, so that the, the lipid phase uh, in the particles crystallizes, 
And after that, we were performing a mild, uh, low temperature homogenization with uh, liquid oil rich in uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids because we were interested in, uh, in lipid oxidation. And then uh, by uh, this, we actually were able to form uh, what we called CLP, so for colloidal lipid particle stabilized uh, emulsion. So with solid lipid particles at the surface of liquid oil droplets. So just to give you an idea of how those systems look, we actually worked quite a lot uh, on, on, on this type of system. We showed that they were actually very versatile in the type of homogenization conditions that they could withstand, with very mild uh, homogenization leading to very large droplets, some non-spherical droplets, typical also of pickering emotions that could be uh, clearly distinguished up to uh, relatively small oil droplets uh, when because those particles also had the property to be uh, very well resistant to, uh, to, to, to high pressure homogenization as long as the temperature was not increased too much. And we uh, determined that it also led to uh, pickering emulsions that were highly stable in time with a, a droplet size that need, did not change over several months of storage. Uh, we also showed that uh, depending on the surface properties of the particles that we were created and also of the of the degree of crystallization of the uh, of the of the lipids in the particles, we could really tune the absorption properties of the of the particles. Um, so for oil and water emulsions, we determined that, for example, having a small amount of protein at the surface of those uh, lipid particles was actually ideal to confer them with a, a wettability that was uh, that was uh, appropriate. Whereas when we had a little bit of surfactant or no emulsifier at all, then we had some uh, platelet-like -like particles that were much too uh, hydrophobic and with which we then could not make uh, physically stable pickering emulsions, oil and water pickering emulsions. So now um, there are, of course, uh, also other ways uh, to um, uh, other types of particles that can be used, and I think it's uh, particularly interesting to also fo focus uh, on uh, natural structures, so that can be found uh, in uh, biological samples or also in uh, byproducts or co-products of the of the food industry, for instance. Um, and I have listed here a couple of examples that uh, of particles that have been successfully used for pickering stabilization, going, for example, with uh, cocoa particles, uh, curcumin particles, uh, also some talking, uh, speaking about byproducts, uh, apple pomace particles or, or particles that were uh, um, cakes of uh, so, so extraction residues, uh, in that case of matcha tea, but there have been other examples as well. So the, 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 there is actually a broad range of, of particles that have proved uh, useful for such uh, applications. Um, so in my opinion, it's actually uh, interesting to also compare the, the, let's say, the advantages and disadvantages of the different approaches to get uh, bio-based particles that are suitable for pickering stabilization. This type of bottom-up approach where you start from distinct ingredients and then through a highly controlled process, you build particles that have the properties that you want and that can then absorb at the interface is indeed good for, uh, with regards to understanding the mechanisms and controlling the properties of the system. But then from an application perspective and also from for sustainability reasons, clean label uh, and, and in a clean label perspective, I think it could also be highly promising to consider the other approach going more top down where you start from structures that uh, naturally exist and then ideally via a mild processing, you would actually get uh, part particle ingredients uh, that would actually be able to form pickering emulsions. The drawback being that then you have to deal with the, the high uh, structural complex and compositional complexity of those uh, systems, um, which can also be quite challenging to, uh, to perform. Um, speaking about challenges, actually, yeah, I think it's important to also recall that uh, well, in the 20th century, basically, uh, most of the research on pickering emulsions was done uh, on, uh, let's say, non-foods, uh, inorganic particles uh, with a very highly controlled um, shape and size, for example, silica particles that have been widely used. Uh, so there have been a lot of knowledge that has been generated uh, through uh, studying those samples. But of course, uh, from the moment that we start from uh, bio-based fractions, and especially via this top-down approach, 
the system probably looks more like this with not only particles, but also a lot of, uh, of well, for example, uh, soluble molecules maybe, and particles that have a broad, uh, that ex exhibit a, a broad um, uh, uh, distribution of shapes, uh, sizes, um, also some, uh, so some other um, components present in the system. So that really, really gives a lot of complexity to those systems. Um, also, the, 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 the it's it's clear that the in those systems the what goes to the interface is maybe only a fraction of the total material and then the the, the composition of the interface does not necessarily reflect that of the whole particle suspension so this uh, should be characterized those non-particle components especially so, small soluble molecules they can also have an effect on the stabilization of emotions um, some uh, physical characterization techniques that were developed for, uh, for example, very model particles uh, are not necessarily applicable to those uh, complex systems. Of course, it's also important to consider the effects of the, that the homogenization process itself may have on the particles. We apply it to create oil droplets, but then it's, it's actually uh, some of some homogenization procedures involve intense uh, shear, and then it's, it, it can directly also affect the, the size and the, and the integrity of the, of the particles. We have particles that are some that sometimes are relatively large, so that also that may also limit the applications, and it's it. Potentially, it's also important to, to assess the, how some structures can also evolve post-adsorption because we are far from the case of uh, uh, strictly solid particles that would actually not change uh, after uh, being adsorbed. So this uh, makes it quite difficult to predict the stabilization capacity among uh, the different uh, particle materials that are available for uh, well, uh, in, the, in the food field. Um, as I mentioned, uh, some conventional methods, for example, that were actually used to determine the contact angles to so the positioning of the particles uh, at an oil water interface are just not adapted when you have particles that have a very broad uh, size and shape uh, distribution. So there are still other um, well, uh, methods or approaches that can be considered to try to determine whether a certain type of a particle suspension could be useful for pickering stabilization. One relatively simple is to uh, check um, the aggregation behavior of particles in suspension. Remember that those particles to form pickering emulsions must have this uh, dual wettability by the oil and the water. So that means that they have a certain degree of hydrophobicity and they normally tend to slightly aggregate in uh, aqueous suspensions. And there are also some uh, compositional uh, parameters, such as uh, content in, in, in proteins, in certain uh, uh, polymers like uh, lignin, that can also be indicative of potentially uh, good stabilization properties. But this is far from, uh, from, uh, from let's say, a systematic, I would say, for the, for the time being. I would also just like to mention a couple of uh, things about uh, if time allows, about lipid oxidation in such emulsions, because this is a topic that I have worked uh, quite extensively on. Um, there, until very recently, there, there has not been a lot of work on, on lipid oxidation in, in pickering emulsions and whether uh, a, a particle layer could be an advantage with regard to protection of the lipids in the, in the oil droplets. It has been proposed by some authors that there might have a, a physical barrier effect of uh, such uh, particle-based layers against lipid oxidation. I think this is probably a little bit more complicated than this because well, if you, even if you would consider very small uh, particles, the gaps between the particles, um, so basically the, 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 the pore size in, in such a particle layer would actually be still very large compared to the size of the molecules that are involved in lipid oxidation, so the, which are typically oxygen or reactive oxygen species or uh, some metal cations such as, uh, such as iron, for example. So a true physical barrier effect is very doubtful in my opinion, yet uh, we also attempted and other people have done so as well, to um, tune actually the particles such that we could, still, uh, uh, we could still obtain a high resistance of the oil inside the, the droplets to oxidation. 
And what we did, uh, also we've been working on this for quite for, for a couple of years now, we developed uh, this concept of trapping natural antioxidants in the particles. So then instead of having only a role of physical stabilization of the systems, now the particles, they have a double role, basically. They still are the physical stabilizers, the emulsifiers in the emulsion, but they are also, uh, they, they, they also entrap antioxidants such that they locate them at the surface of the oil droplets. And then this actually, uh, um, th th this makes a difference compared to the localization of the same antioxidants if you wouldn't have the particles, which would be if it's a hydrophobic antioxidants, which would be then in the, in the center of the oil droplets. So we actually obtain a very good results with this, um, with this strategy. So you can see here actually that we, uh, for example, followed lipid oxidation in two emulsions. So the, 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 the concept emulsion with the antioxidant in the particles in red and the control system with the exact same structure, but the antioxidant was put in the liquid oil droplets. So we saw that indeed the, 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 the concept emulsion uh, almost did not oxidize in the, in the tested conditions. And then we first thought that maybe this is because we had like a kind of a sacrificial role of the of these antioxidants being put at the surface of the oil droplets. Um, but then we also measured the stability of the antioxidant itself, and we found that it was actually uh, also more stable in the concept emulsions compared to the control emulsions where it oxidized relatively fast, prob probably due to the lot to the to the many lipid radicals that were formed upon oxidation in the, in the droplets. So this was quite interesting. And then we uh, also worked a bit more, um, I'm just going to give uh, the, main, uh, the, the main results, but we worked quite extensively on those systems. And we found that actually when we used a, a fluorescent analog of our hydrophobic antioxidants, we, so then we could actually follow it by a, a confocal fluorescent microscopy. And then we saw that at the beginning, so when the emulsion is freshly prepared, we indeed have uh, this, uh, this, uh, this fluorescent analog that is present really around the oil droplets, so at the place that we put it at the beginning. But then we saw that in time, we also had a progressive release from the colloidal lipid particles to the uh, liquid oil droplets inside. So we, it means that our system does not block uh, forever, the, this positioning of the antioxidants at the surface of the oil droplets, but it actually confers it with the what we call the residency time uh, at the interface. So from a mechanistic point of view, that was actually uh, uh, very interesting to see that, and certainly a prom also a promising way to try to tune even, even further the, the, this concept to towards uh, highly oxidatively stable systems. And we also saw that when we put our uh, uh, antioxidant loaded particles only in the continuous phase of the system, then we did not have at all this uh, protective effect against oxidation. So it was also uh, a clear evidence that the interfacial localization of this uh, antioxidant loaded CLPs was needed for having this boosting effect uh, on antioxidant efficiency. Um, this concept has also been uh, uh, since then uh, considered by others, and there have been uh, well quite a, a range of, of uh, particles that have been considered um, using uh, different types of antioxidants and different types of let's say uh, matrix material uh, to, to to make the particles. And this is reviewed also in a recent uh, chapter that we wrote uh, last year. And finally, because all of this is then made with particles that have been purposely made like this bottom up approach yeah, so combining the different ingredients that we want putting them together to create particles that have the antioxidants and then at the interface. But we also worked more recently on using uh, natural particles um, like spinach leaf uh, particles or so much a tea powder uh, uh, part particles because those sources are rich in uh, uh, endogenous antioxidants. And then we also saw that we could reach a very good uh, oxidative stability of those emulsions. So it, it, it shows that beyond the proof of concept that we obtained with our uh, CLPs before, the concept does work also with uh, natural bio-based particles, which seems quite promising for further applications. This is my last, last uh, slide, and I would like just to, uh, because I just wanted to also mention the fact that uh, pickering emulsions have also been considered to, um, 
to uh, control the digestive fate uh, of emotions. It can be actually interesting, uh, for example, to induce uh, society to actually be able to delay uh, the digestion of lipids. And uh, this is a, an interface controlled uh, phenomenon. So therefore, it's, it's actually quite interesting to, to check whether there is also possibility to, uh, to tune the, the digestive fate of the systems with using interfacial particles. So if you are interested in this matter, there, there is actually a nice review that uh, was uh, published also relatively recently, like uh, three years ago. Um, and something that I would just would like to mention, and it's, it's actually also a, a, a nice link to uh, this uh, uh, encapsulation concept that I was mentioning at the beginning. So here, what those people did is actually they made pickling emotions with starch granules absorbed onto the oil droplets. And they applied the heat treatments, which actually made the starch gelatinize. And they saw, they saw that by doing this, they could really reduce the lipolysis. So probably creating a kind of um, a layer that, that was really resistant to, uh, to the digestion of the, of the oil inside the droplets. So I think this is really showing that uh, well, we can probably have a system that could be qualified as an encapsulation and controlled, uh, controlled release system. Uh, so to conclude, uh, well, I, I assume that it's uh, clear that we have currently, we are currently facing this uh, neo pickering era uh, in food science that is a very strong trend. Uh, many particles have been proved uh, useful, often in an empirical manner, uh, but the involved mechanisms are still quite far from being totally understood. Um, and actually, it's important to also design studies in such a way that uh, it can be checked whether this is really a pickering stabilization that we uh, that we encounter. Um, with regard to the applications, there are still ch ch challenges related to the complexity of the currently available particle ingredients, also to their size, sometimes to their color uh, when it comes to, to real applications. But there are clearly some outstanding potential advantages compared to conventional emulsifiers. For example, thinking of a clean label, uh, multiple functionalities. Eh? If, we, if we use the particles for more than only a, a physical stabilization effect, and potentially also for controlled release, if the particles are, for example, sensitive to uh, physical, physical chemical conditions of the, of the medium. So with this, I would like to thank you very much for your attention, and I will be happy later on to answer your questions if you have some. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Claire. Uh, it was a really pleasant presentation, and uh, we will have, we'll answer all the questions after the second tool. But I will just uh, make a comment about your question: Is pickering is encapsulation? My own definition of encapsulation is uh, uh, entrapment in particle or capsule to offer immobilization protection control release, functionalization, and structuration. And you demonstrate that you have, uh, with the Pickering, most of this function working. And for me, it's a kind of encapsulation, especially if some people complete the Pickering by putting a layer of uh, some material around the particle of Pickering. So, the second speaker... <laughs> The second speaker is Romain Bordet from uh, Chalmer University of Technology in Sweden, but is in fact originally from Toulouse. Uh, he worked uh, at the Chalmer University for already, I think, a certain number of years. He's again interested in the surfactant chem chemistry and uh, understanding how the dispersed system is uh, working. He's quite active uh, and especially is editor of a uh, section of surfactant on current opinion for colloid and interface science. And he's even editor of the colloid and surface uh, A physical, chemical, and engineering aspect. Then, Roma, I'm sure that all the participants are waiting implicitly for your presentation.
then I will get going and start sharing. Uh, thanks for this this very kind introduction, uh, Denis, and also thank you, Claire, for this this very nice presentation uh, on on the pickering and uh, applied to food. Um, I will try to to get a little bit away from the food, even though uh, the question of solid emulsion I think is extremely related to food um, to food emulsion. And uh, the story of, of this research that I will try to present today emerged from actually some industrial interest. Uh, at the time, I was part of a, a consortium called Sumo Biomaterials here in Sweden. And um, the research that was going on was, was really transversal of, of many topics. And the Pickering emulsion came, came on, on the way, so to say. And I was about, we started about, say, eight, seven years ago. And I think that was when the blooming era of of emulsion was also uh, reaching all other topics. Um, so before moving on, uh, the, this topic of um, uh, solid emulsion, uh, I, I will try to sort of cover uh, this question of application very, very briefly in, in a couple of slides. And how, uh, when I was involved in this project, I had to, to think that, that through. That, as many of you probably know, there is a large variety of application, uh, food and cosmetics, are, of course, are, are two that, uh, and food in prints mainly were covered by Claire now. Um, but the, the number of application in um, in, in Pickering is, is simply um, gigantic, and it's it's growing on, on a daily basis. So now it's covering agro coatings, which are probably the most evident ways to go. Uh, pharmaceutical, a more emerging field is probably oil drilling, uh, EOR uh, lubes. And especially lubes when it comes to cutting, uh, cutting lubes. I'm not referring to to lubricant uh, in the in the field of um, of engine lubrication, but rather in the field of cutting. There has been also lately uh, an interest raising in the in the field of interfacial catalysis, where the particles can work as heterogeneous catalysts. A typical example is a, is a MOF. Uh, nanoparticles that can be absorbed uh, strategically at the surface of, of an oil that is then reacted. Um, and, and, and it's growing. Uh, it's growing. One field that is growing uh, quite actively is the field of material where basically pickering emulsion are, are used uh, to develop materials. And essentially they are used as a tool uh, to fabricate new materials. The, simply because they are they are good at making foams you can use them to, to make foams and to polymerize then an oil in it uh, then you can use them for tissue engineering uh, the field of membrane for water purification has also been very much interested in using this kind of emulsion because you, you can cast them you, you can do really a lot of things with them and it relies mostly on the fact that you can use them for templating because they can take a lot uh, in terms of stress um, Claire also mentioned that that they are really um, they are really resistant to many external conditions. They can take temperature variation, which in the case of typical amphiphilic surfactant polymeric emulsifier is not always the case. These are sensitive to temperature. If you think of the non-ionic, that's that's a typical case. And also, they they constitute a very nice route to go into this highly internal phase uh, emulsion regime, this hype regime where you, you can start with an emulsion and keep increasing the oil phase without collapsing the emulsion without having a large oiling off. So th there are a number of materials that are currently uh, built. And I think there is a number of questions when one starts to consider uh, a pickering emulsion in the, in the context of an application or to replace or to see if it's better than um, a surfactant or a polymeric a surfactant as emulsifier. Um, the first question I, I believe that is important that we have been posting ourselves is uh, what type of emulsion do you want to achieve? Water in oil or in water, water in water emulsion, whereas the two former uh, oil uh, in water water and oil uh, are um, kind of easy to achieve with particulate system. Water and water are much less common in, in the literature. And same goes for multiple uh, emulsion, where you have multiple compartments of different phases. So that's, that's a layer usually that gets complicated with pickering, as far as I know. And you have to choose wisely your particles. Even though the absorption is very good, it's, it's not always easy. Then the type of oil, um, one thing where pickering emulsion are typically good at is uh, for hard to emulsify oil with, um, with surfactant. They may outperform them and they may work a, a bit easier. So then the next question is what kind of particles? And that's where uh, the hurdle comes. Either you have an experience in particulate and you want to work with them 
Um, otherwise, you, you're facing uh, the question, should we work with organic particles? In organic particles, the, the two main families, synthetic or bio-based uh, type of particles, uh, the concept of protein, polysaccharides, lipids has been extensively uh, presented earlier today, but it's still one of the essence of what is out there, at least in food, uh, because of the nature of these particles that is readily available. And then the future of the particle, of course, their wettability and the partitioning at the oil water interface is very important. Uh, there has been uh, a number of questions back in the days about uh, the, the, the need for the surface activity of the particles. Do they really need to be surface active or not? And there has been a large amount of work done towards the formation of genus uh, particles, one phase that really likes water, one phase that really, one part of the particle that really likes um, uh, oil uh, and to achieve, and whether they can migrate spontaneously to the interface as would do a surfactant. Uh, this question have been more or less settled. There are still plenty of discussion because the dynamics are so different as compared to surfactant and the diffusion of uh, 20 nanometer particles is so substantially different than the diffusion of a surfactant. Uh, that still, uh, it's, it's not settled. Most of the pickering that is out there are usually done with non-surface active particles, meaning if you look at their tendency to migrate spontaneously to the interface, it is very, very poor. Um, how much particles? That is probably another question of interest because as um, also Claire mentioned earlier, if you have too little particles, then you may not cover enough the interface. If you have too many particles, then you have free particles in, in bulk. And then during the emulsification process, they can have um, a detrimental effect. And that is also very important. Uh, in relation to emulsion, the size and the shape of the particles is of course very important. And that is one degree of freedom extra as compared to, to surfactant quite often one can see is that um, particles can be pretty big. Uh, starch particles are typically uh, in the micron sized particles. And yet uh, as the work done by Marilyn Renner in Lund uh, as demonstrated, they can be stable on a very long uh, period of time. And the same goes for smaller particles in, in a way. But then you have to accept that the droplet size may not be as small. And this rule that says that um, if you want to get a very good emulsion based on surfactant, then the smaller the droplet, usually the better. Uh, if you want to have to avoid many different uh, ingredients in, as, a, as a co stabilizer, uh, is not holding here anymore. You can have 10 micron size uh, droplets that will last forever. The the last freedom uh, that one gets with, with this system is also the fact that the particles can be engineered to a much larger extent uh, without playing with molecules, but just by formulation, which is very, very nice. And then one can create uh, stimuli responsive particles. And that is, that is one, one big asset. One uh, other challenge was uh, that one would face when designing Pickering emulsion in terms of formulation is definitely the fact that you offer a new surface for all their ingredients in a formulation to absorb upon. So we're not dealing anymore when, and that is not usually the case where for very good or for very fundamental studies where you have only the oil, the droplet, the, the oil, the water and um, the particles. Uh, in a typical formulation, you will have often a couple, some polymer, some soluble, some additive that will come on the way. And then they will have a chance to also absorb on your particles. So the work of formulation uh, really take its, um, its full dimension uh, when doing so. Uh, and there will be a lot of things happening at the interface, uh, such as particles getting together, this capillary action that could bring them together, uh, the fact that small particles will compete with big ones for the same interface, uh, and polymers will also compete for the same interface. So that's sort of throw the basis of uh, what, what we have been forced to, to think through a little bit when, when we started to discuss this question of uh, solid. Um, the idea and the requirements we got when we started this work was we wanted to have at the end of the day an old content that would be more than 80%. So that means we need not to start with emulsion uh, that were uh, highly loaded with other ingredients than oil, because when you remove the water and you want to have a, a minimal uh, amount of water that remains, 
it essentially implies that uh, there will be only the, the solid and the oil that will remain. And that will be, uh, if, if you start with a 5% surfactant or a 2% surfactant solution plus some polymers that account to stabilize 10% uh, oil, you will not manage to have 80% oil content at the end after the drying. They have to be mechanically resistant because the drying is a stressful process for interfaces. And that means that uh, we need to engineer a bit what's happening at the interface. So it has to get a drying process that can take quite a bit uh, in terms of stress. And eventually, that would be the, the, the cherry on the cake. They would be ideally nice to have them after they are dried. They can be put back in water and then we can get a dispersion that will have more or less the same size distribution or that can at least be redispersible without the need for a massive mechanical action as it was needed uh, when forming the, the primary emulsion. So that was a bit uh, the, the constraint we had ahead of us. And some ingredients that we thought could be interesting for that was cellulose nanocrystals. Uh, I'm working in Scandinavia, so everyone in Scandinavia soon or later works with cellulose. And we started to look at cellulose nanocrystals as well uh, because it's an ice colloid. It's a non uh, isotropic, it's an, uh, an isotropic um, colloid, uh, road like. Earlier work done on emulsion. Uh, was done by Isabelle Capron in France. So that was the pioneering work to, to really show that they could be working as a, uh, as a good emulsifier. And at the time we started that, it was starting to be established that they were good in terms of emulsification. Not everything is clear on the why they do work as a good emulsifier. Uh, it is believed that because of this um, 1D, um, 1D character, uh, they can absorb at the interface and then self-jam at the interface because they have a tendency to have a low percolation threshold. That is not the case for spherical particles, for instance. So that means the viscosity increase that you're observing in a typical nanocellulose uh, material in this road-like system, uh, when you increase the concentration, the, the viscosity increase sharply uh, uh, right after a few percent uh, could be uh, something advantageous if you manage to do that close to the interface. But in a nutshell, uh, cellulose nanocrystals are typically prepared by chemical etching of cellulosic uh, materials. Uh, you want to recover the cellulose fibers, only the most crystalline part of the cellulose fibers. The dimension will vary depending on the, on the species. Uh, soft wood would be, say, 5 to 15 nanometer in diameter and say 215 nanometer in, in length. That will depend on the species, of course. Uh, they are very mechanically resistant. And since they are prepared by chemical etching using most of the time sulfuric acid, they bear negative charge on the surface, which means if you want to make, they are highly dispersible in water, they're highly soluble in water, and their tendency to absorb at the interface is not that great from the beginning, even with thorough shearing. So there is always a need to annihilate these interfaces and salt is typically helping quite a bit in reducing the by length and allowing them to jam the interface. So we had that, and the next ingredient we thought that would be useful since we are working with cellulose derivative, uh, with cellulose nanocrystals was cellulose derivative. Uh, cellulose uh, derivative are, are typically a good example of, of material that uh, have a rather interesting interaction with cellulose nanocrystals, quite often via hydrophobic interactions. They find each other and they arrange each other uh, pretty well. Methyl cellulose and CMC are notoriously known to absorb on, on uh, cellulosic surfaces while uh, being wa uh, largely water uh, soluble. So our ingredients to, to do this kind of emulsion was relatively simple. We decided to use cellulose nanocrystals as particles and, well, see how this could work. Uh, cellulose derivative, uh, probably to reinforce the matrix uh, to withstand the drying. And an oil that, of course, has to be non-volatile. And the oil um, could be relatively versatile. It could be something going from silicon oil all the way to edible oil. And that was a bit of the challenge here to, to be able to, to, to work with with that. Interestingly, in terms of pure emulsification, cellulose nanocrystals were performing very well with very many different types of oil, and the relationship to HLB wasn't that clear uh, to me at this stage. So what do we do? We prepare an emulsion, uh, as it is illustrated here. Uh, we put cellulose uh, nanocrystals, that is called CNC here, cellulose derivative that are in solution. They are fully uh, water soluble. We put the oil, we emulsify, and we let everything dry. And hopefully, we don't have oily engulf. That was uh, a little bit the intention. Uh, 
And the question that we, we started to wonder uh, very early on when coming to, to the concept of cellulose derivative and cellulose ether derivative most of the time, is that some are highly water soluble and not very surface active and some other are surface active. So the question mark we had at this point was, will we have a competition for the interface and who will win in that competition when emulsifying? Eventually we managed to get uh, some, some material and the material didn't oil off. So we were very happy and uh, that was very much independent on the, um, on the on the type of cellulose derivative, so I will guide you through this this cellulose derivative because they have barbarian names, EHEC, HPMC, HEC, and CMC. And if you're not familiar uh, with them, that, that could be a little bit confusing. So EHEC stands for ethyl uh, hydroxyethyl cellulose, and that's usually an amphiphilic uh, derivative of the cellulose. HPMC that's hydropox hydroxypropyl methyl cellulose, that's also an amphiphilic uh, cellulose, and HEC and CMC. CMC stands for carboxymethyl cellulose and uh, HEC for hydroxyethyl cellulose. They are uh, typically uh, highly water soluble, soluble cellulose derivative, and they're not very, they are not very surface active. And what we realized rather rapidly when, when making this solid emulsion, when drying all the water, uh, it was a very simple process, was that if we compress this emulsion, they behave very differently. And more interestingly is that the one that were highly water soluble containing uh, cellulose and crystals and CMC, they were quite resistant against uh, a compressive strain. While if you one would take uh, EEC or HPMC, they were much less resistant and they started to, to really uh, have a response uh, at high uh, compressive strain. So that was telling us that depending on the surface activity of the material, uh, they were able to position themselves at the interface and to behave and to respond mechanically uh, very differently. So we looked a little bit at the microstructure with that question in mind. Uh, Trying to identify cellulose within cellulose is very complicated from that stage because uh, cellulose nanocrystals have a typical cellulosic signature uh, from a spectroscopic standpoint, and so does the cellulose derivative. So it's a little bit difficult. We, so we, we had to do some hypothesis, and what we, we looked into in that case was uh, the difference between a cellulose derivative that was, uh, in that case, uh, surface active versus a cellulose derivative that was not surface active. So yielding these uh, two different behavior. And we could see very clear differences in terms of microstructure of the dry emulsion. No oiling off in both cases, but in one case is round uh, kind of droplets with uh, an interspace between the droplets that was sort of loose, smaller droplet size as well. That was quite obvious uh, in average. And in the case of non-surface active uh, cellulose derivative, we still had uh, very nice droplets, well separated, but with flat interfaces in between. We can clearly see that on some of them, they were very, they were very, very flat, which implies that um, the emulsion can really uh, adapt and really stand uh, the stress during the drying. So with that in mind, we thought, okay, this is great. We probably have the nanocellulose in uh, at the interface when we have uh, a surface, uh, a non-surface active cellulose derivative. And that's what, what we con could confirm by just looking at emulsion with pure CMC, non-surface active polymer, uh, no nanocellulose. And then we have round uh, um, round uh, droplets. When we add uh, cellulose nanocrystals in minute amount, 0.5 weight percent uh, at the beginning and the oil content to start the emulsion was about 20%. We could clearly see that we had flat interfaces, larger droplets, less effective, but it was working. Uh, and that's our hypothesis was that yes, we have interconnection through flat interfaces between the droplets and that is at the origin of the mechanical strengths. Now, when we take EHEC, a surface active uh, cellulose derivative, then we have flat interfaces. And one may wonder, why do you want to have in the end uh, such a mechanically steady uh, emulsion if you want to redisperse it? And that comes probably from the idea that we would like to be able to make tablets out of this material and that we would like to be able to control the mass loss upon pressing. So here, we that was the last study that uh, 
uh, that we did was to compress a little bit the, the emulsion and to look at how much the mass loss was uh, coming. So much oiling off upon compression we could observe. And we could again see these two different behavior. When we had uh, a surface active cellulose derivative, then it was quite steady at the beginning. And as soon as we started to reach a certain step, it was more foamy, so to say, and then we could release while the, the CMC, the non-surface active systems, were much more behaving like in a straight fashion. So as soon as we were pressing on them, there was holding off from the beginning because we were rupturing more efficiently, um, more efficiently the, um, uh, the structure. Anyway, at the end of the day, by playing with that, with material that was up to 83%, we could easily uh, do tabletting and we could have tablets. The question was next, can we have this tablet uh, in a solid form and then put them in water and get uh, uh, the emulsion back uh, without energy input? So this is a little bit what is illustrated on this uh, uh, one to last slide. Uh, we start with an emulsion here. We evaporate the water by a simple casting process. Then we got a dry piece of emulsion. We put it back in a tube. Then we add water. And then without an er energy input, we get back an emulsion. We could evaporate it again, and then we could press it again. And of course, uh, if you look at the compression here, uh, if you look at the, the mechanical curve, I'm not showing them here, they, they will be slightly di different, and they will not be as well performing as the original dry emulsion. But they are still performing well. Um, sorry. Oh. Interestingly, uh, the parent emulsion and the emulsion after redispersion kept more or less the same size, except that we had some clustering that was occurring, which was not, in a sense, very difficult uh, to judge from this picture. But that, upon mild shearing, it was getting off, and we could recover a full emulsion just by by simple shaking. Did someone bring me to the to the conclusion? Um, I wanted to illustrate with that talk that if you somewhat um, design well your, your system and choose wisely your ingredient, understanding the, the competition from the, for the interface, you could have emulsion that can easily be sprayed right, and then you can reach up to 80% or even more oil content. It can also be done by casting. And these are two processes that I find very stressing for, for the emulsion. We can control uh, the strength of the material, of course, by positioning the right um, the right ingredients at the interface. And um, at the end of the day, I, the, the companies with which we did that, that was AstraZeneca, ICT, and Monique Healthcare, they were happy and they, we went on to patent on this work. Uh, and we could find very different application from wound care dressing all the way to, uh, to tableting. That was for in the case of AstraZeneca. And I think that's my last slide. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Romain. Uh, maybe uh, we will go to the period of questions, then I will ask to Claire to open his video and microphone. Yeah, and uh, I will look for the question. Uh, the first question, don't be shy to ask who's a question because we have three questions for now. The first one is coming from Rocio uh, Morales Medina, which is working at uh, TU Berlin. Uh, she said, great talk and overview, really interesting. I would like to know the size range of the particle employed, which size can be considered too large for the emulsion with uh, D90 uh, of one micrometer. Uh, and thanks a lot for your presentation. Uh, then probably both of you, you can answer. I think uh, it's up to you. Yes, sure. Well, I, I think it's indeed interesting to compare um, different um, well, points of view about this, because um, in the case of this uh, colloidal lipid particles that we worked with, they were they actually had a very narrow size distribution themselves. We had sizes between 120 and 150 nanometers, so that was really small, and well, then then that was actually working very well. Um, now, when we switch to the natural particles, we uh, and that I, I, I also checked the, the questions in the in the chat actually, and I think that also addresses the second question uh, of the person who also asked uh, things about uh, particle size. We had a very broad uh, size distribution of the particles in the suspension, uh, going from less than one micron to tens of uh, microns. 
Um, what I suspect, and we're also currently performing some work to, uh, to, to look into this further, is that um, only a fraction, probably the finest one, of the of the particles do absorb at the interface. So then it's actually um, it's actually not the, the average size of your particle suspension does not necessarily reflect the size of the particles that will do the job at going to the interface and stabilizing the uh, the emulsion. And and on top of this, I would also highly recommend that if you would uh, want to make picking emulsions with uh, particles with a relatively large size and, and 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 large size distribution, you would also check the effect of the homogenization itself on the size of the particles in suspension because maybe they are themselves affected by the homogenization process, and you would have a decrease in the particle size simply due to the uh, homogenization process. I don't know, Romain, if you have uh, also other. I think I think that's that's that, that's uh, that's a great that when working with natural substances uh, there will be a point for you this fractionation will is eventually needed to to just ensure what is doing what because as you really clearly said you it comes with so much materials you don't know what is doing what and uh, the smallest particles uh, we, we discussed that at some point with um, with Marilyn Rayner, and um, those very small particles are nice because they can be easily taken in a flow and so on, but they, they are also diffusing faster with their own self-diffusion, and they have less energy to attack touch and an interface. Bigger particles, in, in the case of a, a simple uh, shear uh, mixer, they will be taken in with the drag of the flow very easily and they can attach. So it's it's really also, I think there is a relationship in the way it is processed to prepare the emulsion. So coming back to this question, one micron uh, droplet, if you want to make one micron droplet size, uh, I, I would say uh, uh, probably 50 nanometer would be a qualified guess to go and bigger particles would be too big. That's, uh, uh, if you want a binary answer, a safe, a qualified guess would be there. Though if it doesn't work, uh, don't blame us. <laughs> okay, the next question is a little bit similar, but in a different context. Uh, Li, Liu, Liu asks, uh, what will be the typical size of natural particle? And she talk about uh, matcha teas and spinach in relation with the size of the droplet. Yeah, yeah, so this is why I, I, I um, uh, well, also tried to address this question already, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, we also published those data, so, so of course uh, you are very welcome to, uh, to also look into the paper, but we had a, a size distribution of the particles that was ranging from submicron to a, a few tens of microns, with the slight variations between both um, uh, sources that we used. Um, and then we had uh, oil droplets that were in the order of magnitude of uh, yeah, 10 microns, a little bit more. Um, so, so there was clearly an overlap, and this is also what, uh, what makes me uh, uh, say that, uh, that, that well, this is not the, the full range of particles in the, the, the solving sample that, does, uh, that is responsible for the physical stabilization. Okay, uh, Denis Renard is uh, addressing question to Claire, but I think uh, the answer is maybe from Romain. He say, uh, what is the add value to use pickering emission compared to classical emission for microencapsulation, and especially say, what about drying the pickering emulsion mm -hmm. and consequently on the morphology? Well, I, I'm not sure if the question still uh, hold after my presentation, but mm -hmm. uh, my, my take on what we have found or what we have used was that uh, it's very easy to process when we are doing with pickering emulsion. And I have really, very little experience of, on drying surfactant or polymer stabilized emulsion. Uh, my first qualified guess is the quantity of uh, stabilizer that you need to add to get to the right uh, dry system. Most likely you need more. Uh, no, the, the big ring emulsion we did with cellulose nanocrystals, they were at 0.5 weight percent. We could lower that and still dry them without any oiling off. Uh, that was one thing. And since I am at it, um, there was a question about shear stress from uh, Jenny, because that comes also uh, part, I can give a part of the answer here. Uh, when we are drying uh, while casting the emulsion, it's one thing, and it's kind of a mild drying process. It's, it's slow, it is stressful because it's slow, but there is no shear stress. Now, when we were spray drying uh, some of this emulsion, we were throwing, flowing through the spray dryer. It was high temperature, high flow rate, and yet uh, we could encapsulate everything uh, with nearly no loss. 
In fact, uh, I will even probably add that from your presentation, I will have tendency to say that probably you can probably reach higher concentration of oil when you make spray drying using pickering than using a normal emulsion, which is mm. probably something which will interest any because you specialize, especially in a, in a spray drying. Uh, Ali uh, is asking, is, is it possible to encapsulate an hydrophobic molecule in a such solid emulsion? Uh, how about the drying of this system? Is it the solid emulsion can stabilize the active compound? I think uh, you already have a little bit answer mm -hmm. to the question, but if you have more comments, then is it? Um, yeah, I, I think the cool thing, at least with the solid emulsion, is that you end up with a solid matrix around the droplet and the permittivity, if you think about stability, chemical stability, I assume that Ali refers to uh, chemical stability of the, of the active compound. Uh, then the, the chemical uh, stability, uh, or if there is a sensitivity to oxygen, the, the, the cellulosic nature in such a case was also very good at slowing down the permeation of oxygen. So we could probably, we could protect uh, from oxidation because the permeation through the oxy of oxygen through the barrier was reduced. Uh, and I think that's indeed an interesting point because when you have, uh, let's say, uh, classical dried emulsions, eh? like if you think, uh, well, in food science, this is typically an infant mm -hmm. formula, then of course, you, it's difficult because you, uh, when you study oxidation, because then you would have uh, to, to distinguish between the, the encapsulated fats, so the one mm -hmm. that is still in the droplets embedded within the glassy matrix, so basically no molecular mobility, but you also have a lot of uh, what is called free fats, that is actually, uh, that is coming from uh, yeah, coalescence and then uh, uh, droplets that are directly accessible to, uh, at the surface of the, mm. of the powder particles. And if you could avoid this um, uh, with, uh, by, by, by starting from a pickering emulsions, that would be a, certainly a great asset. Okay. Jenny is asking if the behavior depends on the free pickering, pickering particle in the continuous phase. Uh, I guess that depends on whether the question is about physical uh, behavior, like um, rheological properties of physical stability, or if it's more about oxidative stability. Um, so, well, physical stability and rheological properties, yes, of course, in the sense that uh, if you have uh, particles that uh, form a network in the continuous phase, that will directly affect the uh, uh, the flowing properties, so the rheological properties, and that can in turn prevent uh, creaming. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and then coalescence. Um, it, it was the viscosity. She clarified it at the end ah, of the question and uh, answer okay. at, at the bottom. I was checking while you were answering. Yeah, yeah. So then, of course, yeah, you you, you would uh, you would directly have an effect if you have particle network. And and actually, the um, this is I believe something that um, that can even be used purposely because, well, by definition, sometimes you have uh, as Roman also said relatively large. Uh, droplets when you make pickering emulsions, and that's not necessarily a problem if they are not subjected to coalescence. But for applications, if they cream very fast, that can still mm. be something that the manufacturers would not want. And then if you have a product that is more viscous, yeah, in fact, you will uh, you will prevent creaming very efficiently. So, mm. Ali is asking if you uh, that you observe some migration of the antioxidant in the NP. Yeah. Uh, nanoparticle to the oil. Are you interested to keep the antioxidant inside the nanoparticle? Yeah, I think that's indeed, uh, we have discussed so much about this point. Um, because what, what, uh, what we are thinking is that there is probably an optimum. If you would, if the, if the release is very fast, then probably you just lose rapidly the benefit of putting all this effort to construct the system in such a way that you have the antioxidant at the interface. On the other hand, if you would immobilize the antioxidant so efficiently that it will never ever uh, be released, does it mean that you could also hamper its uh, chemical activity? So it's uh, antioxidant activity. We cannot exclude it, but we haven't been able to uh, to perform such a, such a, let's say um, uh, uh, such a full immobilization yet. Okay, at I think we arrived right to the sense. end of the question, but I have one. Uh, none of you have talked about the uh, surface covered by the, the particle. 
And I remember I saw some presentation from Veronique Schmidt that was saying that you can have pickering with, a, uh, I will say, a little surface covered by the particle. Mm. And know the way I went to a thesis last week when they was even thinking that it could be several layers of particle around the, the, the droplet. Mm. So what do you feel? Uh, the, the work of Veronique Schmidt was with microgels, I believe. Eh? Yes, maybe, maybe it's with the pinny palm uh, with the pinny palm microgels. Yeah. microgels. Yeah. So they, they, they are soft and they would also spread, I think, and having this uh, like a, uh, like a core cool corona core uh, structure, right, uh, Romain? I think this mm -hmm. is about this work that uh, yeah. that uh, Denise. Uh, I, I would I would put as an extra layer of uh, this question that depends on the to just put us on the safe side. It depends on the size of the particles. Uh, the work done by by the people in Lund Rainer and uh, and Sugren. Uh, I think yeah, they, they are uh, with this uh, quinoa starch. The quinoa starch are so big that you don't need to have full coverage to get to prevent. They work a little bit as a steric stabilizer in a way. So the, the, the oil droplet surface never get in touch with each other because they are so big. Now, if you take very tiny nanoparticles, 20 nanometer, 30 nanometers, partially hydrophobized, you better have a higher surface coverage uh, because to be on the safe side, I would say. And then you, because you put more, they may aggregate, jam at the surface, and then you may have a couple of layers. And that is quite also observed. Uh, so I think there is an interdependence with the size of the droplets to stabilize the particles there. Okay, thanks a lot to Claire and Romain. Uh, I will uh, just remember that uh, normally over, let's say today, I will post the, this uh, webinar on YouTube, then you can uh, look it again. And you have in the presentation, the email of uh, both speakers. And if you have any more questions, you can in fact contact that. Uh, I will finalize this webinar by just uh, advertising the future events for the, the BRG. We have an industrial convention, which is a mix of uh, presentation, showcase, but especially a uh, business to business meeting. We organize several hundred meetings over two and a half days. And if you are really mainly involved in industrial project, you are, will be welcome. We have uh, two uh, webinars which are scheduled. One which will be pellet production by fleet bed coating from somebody from GLAD. Uh, I wait uh, the, the confirmation ex of the exact date and I will publish on the BRG website. And I will make one, myself a presentation on the dripping technology in May. And if you want uh, any more information about both these events or the past, a webinar, don't hesitate to visit the uh, bioencapsulation.net. Thanks to everyone, and I hope we will uh, meet you again in the next webinar or never know in the face to face meeting. Based on... Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.